is as turning the water into wine. So today, we're going to continue this theme of encounters with Jesus, uh, but we're going to do it through this moment in time that Jesus has an encounter at our wedding. So we're going to open up to John chapter 2. Maybe you have your Bibles on your phones. If you need a Bible, there are some Bibles at the back. Steph can come around and hand them round to you. Otherwise, I think they should come up on the screen as well. I forgot that. Okay, John chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. It says this, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. There's a few surprising things going on in this passage. So I want you to take a moment for a second and turn to the person next to you. And as we've been thinking about encounters with Jesus, I want you to answer this question. What have you found most surprising about Jesus? It could be of late or it could be in your life. You could be someone who's new to faith or you've been on a journey for a while. But what have you found surprising about him? So why don't you take a moment, turn to the person next to you and talk about what have you found surprising about Jesus? Well, I'm going to draw you back. I'm going to draw you back. Back to me. I'm going to draw you back. (laughs) Some good conversations there. What do you find surprising about Jesus? I'd encourage you. That's a good conversation starter. A great conversation starter. Maybe something that you could ask over lunch when you take your pastors out to lunch this afternoon. What do you find surprising about Jesus? What do you find surprising? Good question to ask other people. What do you find surprising about Jesus? Well, in John 2, we discover a few very surprising things about Jesus. And of course, the context is a wedding. Now, weddings uh, can be wonderful, but they can also have a tendency to not always go the way you expected. Take, for example, this handsome young couple up on the screen. So young. Well, at least one of us was young. The other one wasn't so young, but pretty naive, I would say. (laughs) Uh, So our wedding took place, believe it or not, at a time when Queensland had had its highest ever recorded flood. So on the day of our wedding, the heavens unveiled and poured out water. So And this is what happened. This is our town of Brisbane. And over the course of a a week, Brisbane was totally flooded. And I'm talking about like the the hotel that we stayed in for our wedding night the very next day was swept away (laughs) in a flood. Um, We went on honeymoon. Some of our good friends were homeless. So they moved into our apartment that we were going to move back into while we were away. Uh, So this flat, this rain started up north and then worked its way down to Brisbane. And for us, what that meant was we we have a lot of family from up north. So on the day of our wedding, this family that were trying to come to our wedding couldn't make it. They couldn't pass rivers. So uh, basically, 
we had a reception with not many guests. So at our ceremony, I know, at our ceremony, we were madly running around to anyone, like the cater, you know, the servants, the people we hardly ever knew. Do you want to come? Do you want to come to our to our reception? Because we had paid a lot of money for this reception and didn't want it to go to waste. So it meant that our reception was a rather random bunch of people. (laughs) So weddings don't always go the way that you expect them to. And this is certainly the case for this wedding in Cana. This wedding is heading for potential disaster. It's halfway through its festivities and in that time and in that cultural context, weddings lasted for up to several days. And so halfway through the festivities, one of the worst things that could possibly happen has happened. They have run out of wine. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is that a bad thing? Well, in that culture, guests expected to be both well-fed and (laughs) well-watered, shall we say. And not just expected it. But in that time, it was a social obligation. In fact, a lack of good hospitality could result in a lawsuit between the bridegroom's family and the bride's family. That's how serious it was. It's not just about not having enough to drink. It's about social shame and potential disharmony. Someone, not mentioning any names, but I think it was probably the bridegroom, has either not planned this wedding well or they actually don't have the financial resources that they needed to fulfill everyone else's expectations. And it's probably more likely the second. Either way, it's it's a major social faux pas that will have implications for this couple long into their marriage. So what is to be done? Who could possibly redeem this situation? And this is when Jesus enters in. Now, we don't always think of Jesus as the party rescuer, do we? Or the wine connoisseur. It's not immediately what comes to mind. But Jesus has a remarkable way of defying our preconceived ideas about him. No matter where we might be at in our faith, whether we're new to faith, whether we're long on on the journey of faith, wherever we're at, Jesus likes to surprise us. And there are many things about this miracle that are surprising. And so this morning, I want to hone in on just three and see what Jesus might have for us, what he might want to show us about our lives, how he might want to expand our understanding around who he is. And the first thing that I find surprising about this is in this miracle, we see a reluctance that leads to abundance. Now, I don't know about you, but I found Jesus' interaction with Mary a bit curious, let's just say. Mary, as his mother, comes to Jesus with a problem. There's no wine left. And it's probably the case that both Mary and Jesus are somehow related to the bridal party, which is why Mary takes it upon herself to come to Jesus to seek a solution. Now, of course, we know by reading the text that eventually Jesus performs a miracle where not only does he spontaneously produce wine of an outstanding quality, but he also produces an amount of wine that would not have only been ample for the rest of the festivities, but there would have been leftovers. And some commentators suggest that that what that meant was that this bridal party had leftovers that they could sell in order to make provision for their life. So Jesus performs a miracle that leads to abundance. But initially, he appears to not only be reluctant, but even a little bit abrupt, I'd say, towards Mary. The question is why? What's going on here with this interaction between Mary and Jesus? Well, to understand it, we're gonna just look a little bit more closely at this interaction. So when Mary comes to Jesus with the problem, Jesus responds by saying, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now, it's an interesting response. Not only because to our modern ears, it appears a little bit disrespectful to call Mary woman, but because it also conveys an idea that perhaps Jesus is disinterested in what's going on here. But I want to just tell you that that's really not the case. The first thing to say here is that when Jesus uses the term woman here, 
unlike how we might hear it, it's actually a respectful term. He uses it quite a bit, actually, in John's Gospel, if you read through John's Gospel. Um, And it's actually more akin to my dear lady or madame. (laughs) So it's more respectful than perhaps what we hear it. But it's still not as intimate as what we would expect when it comes to someone addressing their mother, which is probably the point. Because what I think Jesus wants to remind Mary about, and perhaps also us as his readers, is that Mary might be the mother of Jesus, but Jesus is the Son of God. And the next phrase helps us to see that Jesus is taking a moment right now right at the beginning of his ministry, to bring this to her attention. Jesus follows this uh, title woman by saying, why do you involve me? And actually, the way that it's written in Greek, uh, it's written literally as, what to me and to you? (laughs) Um, And actually, it's a Hebrew idiom that we find all throughout the Old Testament, And throughout the Old Testament, it's used to convey the idea of distance between two parties. And it's often found when two parties have conflicting ideas, which is why if you read different versions of the Bible, they will sort of interpret it in different ways. So some versions say, what have I to do with you, Mary? While other versions might interpret it as, what's this problem got to do with us? So either Jesus is putting some distance between himself and Mary, or he's putting some distance between himself and the problem at hand. Now, of course, he follows this with the phrase, my time has not yet come, which relates to his own death on the cross. It's a phrase that he used again often throughout John's gospel. And actually, one of the things that you'll notice if you take the time to read John's gospel, which I would encourage you to do, is you'll notice how often Jesus has in mind his ultimate mission, where he is really heading to, how often that is at the back of his mind. Whenever he's meeting people and dealing with their presenting need, it seems as though what's always in the back of his mind is his ultimate call and his ultimate call to the cross. So it might come across a bit heartless, especially to those of us who are mothers or feelers by nature. But essentially, Jesus is saying, Mary, I'm not under any obligation to you. My obligation is to my heavenly Father, first and foremost, and to what he has set for me to do. And so for Mary, this is a moment of transition from being his mother to now learning what it means to be his disciple. And Mary, like all of us, need to understand something about being a disciple that whilst Jesus wants to um, meet our presenting needs, he always has in view our deeper need and our greater good. And so it's not for us to bend God's will to ours, but for us to surrender ours to his. Now, Mary obviously isn't offended by what Jesus says because she turns to the servants and she says, do what he tells you. And with these simple words, she gets to the heart of what being a disciple is. That at the heart of discipleship is not just faith coming to Jesus, but also obedience. That's the heart of what being a disciple is. Not that we just bring our needs to Jesus, but that we're prepared to listen for how he might want us to act as a consequence. So Mary shows us to expect Jesus to do big things but not to tell him how to do them, rather to follow his lead. So let me ask you, are you willing to let Jesus take the lead in your life? That's the first thing for us to consider today. The second thing that I find surprising about this miracle is there seems to be a secrecy that unfolds in splendor. Now, John tells us in verse 11 that this is the first of the signs which Jesus revealed his glory through. The Bible often uses the word signs for miracles because they are intended to point to a deeper reality or truth than just the miracle in and of itself. So this is the first of seven signs that we find in the Gospel of John. In fact, the first 11 chapters of God of John's gospel are known as the book of signs. And they're designed to be a bit like a treasure hunt. 
leading us to a deeper understanding and revelation of who God is. And so the seven signs that we have, they'll come up on the screen. We have the first one, which is Jesus turning water into wine. Oh, no, we don't have them. Go back. <laughs> I thought it was up there. Jesus turning water to wine. Then we have the healing of the official son, the healing of the paralytic at Bethesda, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the man born blind, and finally climaxing in raising Lazarus from the dead. This is Jesus' very first sign. It's the very first event that demonstrates his divine authority. It's the very first time that he begins to demonstrate the kingdom at work on earth and he as its king. And I don't know about you, but as I reflect upon this, for the very first inaugural sign, it's much more unassuming than what we might expect. For example, not many people are in the know, so to speak. Uh, we have a few of Jesus' disciples, but not all. In chapter 1, we read that he has called Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and one other unnamed disciple, which is probably John. So there's five disciples at this point. And then we know that Mary's in on it. She knows what's happening. And then a few servants are in on it as well. But nobody else at the party knows. Not the master of the ceremony, not the bridal party, and not the guests. In fact, it's the bridegroom who gets the credit for the outstanding wine and not Jesus. Furthermore, if you think about it compared with Jesus' other miracles like healing the sick, feeding the 5,000, dealing with demons, walking on water, raising the dead, making sure that people have a good time at a party seems a little less important. But this is Jesus' first act as the Messiah. It's surprising, especially if you compare it with the first acts of other monarchs throughout history. And so I did a little research what do other kings do as their first act uh, to demonstrate their authority? And here's, some, uh, here's a flavor of some of the things. So we have William the Conqueror after becoming king of England following his victory at the Battle of Hastings. He ordered a comprehensive survey of his new kingdom known as the, the Doomsday Book. So basically wanted to know, what do I own? What's my dominion? What's my kingdom? What's the boundaries of my kingdom? Louis XIV built, built what? Who knows what Louis XIV built? Is there's a picture up there. Versailles, the Grand Palace of Versailles. Anyone been there to Versailles? Yes, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's a palace of grand proportions and immense beauty. Napoleon Bonaparte, after declaring himself Emperor of the French in his first act, his first act was to carefully stage a coronation at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, where he famously took the crown from the Pope and placed it on his own head. King Ludwig II of Bavaria. Anyone heard of King Ludwig? He's a bit of an eccentric king, yes. He built for himself some of the most extravagant and fantastical castles. Apparently, he was obsessed with fairy tales. And so that castle up there is one of his castles. So he, he spent all of the royal treasury building castles like this. And I think it turns out <laughs> the people revolted against him and so he retreated into the castles. Um, and then finally, Emperor Nero, this one I loved, he rigged the Olympic Games. So <laughs> he was famous for his vanity and eccentricity. And he was incredibly overweight. But he decided to compete in the Olympic Games. And uh, he entered a 10-horse chariot race in which he fell off his chariot and yet still managed to be declared the winner because he was the emperor. <laughs> you have all of these incredible monarchs throughout history who make incredible demonstrations of their power in grand palaces and stage coronations and rig Olympics games. And then you've got Jesus of Nazareth, God's chosen one, we read about in Job chapter 1. And in his very first act, <clears throat> in his very first demonstration of his power and his authority, he rescues a couple from social shame and he restores joy to a wedding feast 
in a way that though everyone gets to taste the fruit of his miracle, very few people know from whose hand it was come. And this is how John says Jesus reveals his glory. What I love about Jesus, what I'm always surprised by, is that Jesus, unlike earthly kings, has no need to be an exhibitionist. He does not feel the need to be applauded nor compensated. He does not need to maintain false perceptions of power by building grand palaces or staging large-scale coronations. His glory is not a mirage that needs to be manufactured and maintained. It is innate to who he is. And as the son of God, he does not rule by stripping people of their power, but he uses his power to extravagantly bless others, generously giving to those who are undeserving, impoverished, and even ignorant. Jesus Christ comes quietly, yet powerfully, into the situations and lives of those who have invited him. And the ripple effects of that means that others get blessed through it. Such is the work of God. Such is the splendor of God. Such is the splendor of who Jesus is. From secrecy to splendor, the unassuming and yet powerful work of God is such that God in Jesus reveals himself enough so that those who want him will find him, but not too much so as to force their hand. For Jesus will not force anyone to bend their knee to him. Now John tells us that the disciples watched this. And that they believed. In Jesus, they saw the goodness of God at work in ordinary life. They saw the hope of heaven come and transform a hopeless situation. And they saw a humble king touching lives with his generosity and grace. And it brought them to their knees. They followed the signs to the person of Christ. Whilst Mary shows us to expect big things from God, but not to presume to tell him how, the disciples show us that that there is one thing, that it is one thing to experience the generosity of God, but it is far better to experience God himself. So I wonder, just just to get you to reflect for a moment, do you always want just the blessings from God or do you want the blessing of knowing God himself? It's a key question to ask yourself. Do you want God for what he can give you or do you just want, do you want God? The third surprising thing, and this is where we'll sort of finish today, is I see in this miracle an an emptiness that is filled to overflowing. We read that Jesus tells the servants to take six stone jars, the kind used for ceremonial washing by the Jews, and fill them to the brim with water. Now, each of them held between 20 to 30 gallons of water. In our metrics, that's about 75 to 115 litres. And so I did the maths on that. That's, that altogether, that could have been 690 litres. Now, to just give you a picture of that, we're talking about 920 bottles of wine. Almost 1,000. Now, that's a good seller. Maybe it's close to William Bevington's so. cellar. <laughs> I was at William and Hester's last night, and we had some good wine, didn't we? Yes, so yeah. Um, that's quite a bit of wine, I'm just saying, and more than is even necessary. And when the master of the ceremony tastes it, he states that it's of such fine quality, not what you would normally expect at this stage of a wedding feast. And so Jesus saves the best to last. He's an incredibly good host that people have more than they need. And one of the things I find really surprising is how Jesus takes vessels ordinarily used by the Jews for ceremonial washing and works in them this transformative miracle, changing water into wine. And I'll tell you why it's surprising. It's surprising because what these vessels symbolized, they were not just jars, they symbolized the ritualistic attempts of self-righteousness where people believed that through their own efforts, they could cleanse and make themselves right with God. This false idea that somehow you can wash away your own moral brokenness. Somehow through your own efforts, you can make yourself good enough for God. In other words, these vessels symbolize the project of self. And here is where I want us to land today, because in our time, the project of self is so alluring. 
It might not be through ceremonial washing or upholding the Mosaic law, but we have a tendency to want to go it alone, to be self-made individuals, to be seen to be self-reliant and self-sufficient. Through our own efforts, we try to craft a life for ourselves that we think will make us feel good about ourselves. And we falsely think that if we just have enough of this or that, then we'll feel at peace and we'll feel happy and satisfied. And so we work at having more and being more, having more stuff and being more fit, more beautiful, more productive, more capable, more competent, more time efficient, more knowledgeable. But the irony is, is that the pressure to have and be more often leads to being more dissatisfied, more frantic, more chaotic, more anxious and more heavy laden. It turns out the project of self is a burden that we were never meant to bear because our problem is not that we don't have enough. It's that we don't have what we really need. Friends, we need Jesus. We need God to be with us. Our lives are empty without him. We were never intended to live this life on our own and in our own strength. No project of self can meet the desire for life eternal, for a love unconditional, and for a purpose beyond this world. We need something more than ourselves. We need Jesus to fill our lives with his abundant self-giving and supernatural presence. And so Jesus takes these vessels brimmed to the top with water and supernaturally turns the water into wine. Now in Isaiah 25, verse 6 to 10, the prophet Isaiah, he speaks to Israel, a people who are exiled, they're broken, they're depleted, and they feel despair. And he speaks to them about a future expectation of celebration, joy, and feasting as God's people are drawn into the future blessing of God's presence with them. And one of the characteristics of this future blessing is the abundance of wine. In Isaiah chapter 25, we read it, and I've got it in the message version for you. It says this, but here on this mountain, God of angel armies will throw a feast for all the people of the world, a feast of the finest foods, a feast with vintage wines, a feast of seven courses, a feast lavished with gourmet desserts. And here on this mountain, God will banish the pall of doom hanging over all peoples, the shadow of doom darkening all nations. Yes, he'll banish death forever. And God will wipe the tears from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace. For his people, wherever they are, yes, God says so. I think, and this is just my thoughts, that Jesus had a little chuckle to himself when he looked over and he saw those stone jars. I think it speaks to his humour that he would take these vessels that symbolically lead to the burden of self-effort and supernaturally fill them with wine, the symbol of joy and gladness. And in doing so, he would point to a deeper reality that the joy-filled life, a life of true satisfaction and abundance, is not a result of your own efforts, nor is it the accumulation of things and accomplishments or experiences. It's a supernatural gift and only a work that God can do in your life. Of course, this miracle points to the greatest miracle of all the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus makes it possible for empty vessels like you and me to be filled with everlasting and abundant joy. I love Dallas's Willard's quote where he says, in the presence of Christ, our cup overflows, not because we have more than we need, but because he is more than enough. I wonder, is our surprising Messiah more than enough for you? Do you want more of him? I think if we're going to enter into Christ's abundance, then we will have to exercise abandonment. And what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to have to abandon our self-reliance and the belief that we can make life work on our own terms. We will have to abandon the constant striving to be enough on our own, to find ultimate satisfaction in what we can do, have or control. We will need to abandon the things that we think will bring us fulfillment, our plans, achievements, relationships, and the images of success that we craft for ourselves. And instead, we must cling to Christ, the source of all abundance. In a world that constantly tells us to hustle, to maximise our potential and to craft our best selves, Jesus gently reminds us that real fulfilment comes not from what we can achieve, 
but for, from surrendering to what he can give. And Jesus is not stingy. For with Jesus, there is always more. There's always more grace. There's always more love. There's always more strength. There's always more hope. There is always more peace. There is always more. And so maybe today, just maybe, you need more of him and less of you.